Casting. Here we go. Oh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Dill. I'm faculty member in Urban Studies and Planning and director of the Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium, OTREC. Uh, we are helping to co-sponsor today's seminar. We have a special uh, visiting um, scholar with us today, Peter Jacobson. We're really happy to have him. Uh, earlier in the week, he was speaking at the Oregon Transportation Safety Conference and also met with folks at ODOT. Um, has been creating quite um, a lot of interest uh, in interviewed earlier in the week on bikeportland.org, uh, which anecdotally I have to say, I even got an email from my sister who doesn't uh, do anything professionally with transportation or safety or anything, and she had read it and asked me about the ideas, you know, as a concerned parent of teen drivers. Um, she liked what she heard there. Um, so we're really happy to have Peter. I think many of you may have read his article about safety in numbers and that concept. Uh, it's been a very popular concept that uh, folks in Portland and elsewhere have been talking about and perhaps seen on the roads here in Portland with our bicyclists. We're really happy to have him um, here today to talk talk about some other traffic safety issues. So welcome, Peter. Oh, one thing I should have to remind people that we are webcasting. Um, so if you do ask questions at the end, we'll have time for questions. Um, you do need to use the microphones um, on the desk. Keep the touch button. Um, hold the touch button, keep the red light lit while you're asking the question. If yours does not work, like the one right here does not appear to be working or you don't have one, we'll bring along the portable mic for you. And then I'm also sending around the sign-in sheet for students who are taking this as a class. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. And hopefully the mechanics will all work out okay today. Um, Vision Zero, I'm kind of wondering how many people have heard the phrase Vision Zero, just like a show of hands. Is this well, in, oh my goodness, this is good. I, I actually gave a Vision Zero talk actually yesterday, and maybe a third of the folks who were sort of in the transportation safety business had heard about Vision Zero. So, so it's really nice to hear, to see that Vision Zero is starting to be, um, you know, here we are, the students are starting to hear the, the idea of Vision Zero and, and think about it. So um, I'm, I'm excited that it's that well here, known here. Let's see, how are we going to do this? Talk about mechanics. There we go. Um, I see Vision Zero is, is kind of like what traffic calming was maybe 15, 20 years ago. And I got involved with traffic calming, um, actually with a woman in the back row there, about 20 years ago, trying to push this as you know, effort for pediatric injury prevention. Ch children are being hurt on residential streets, um, basically in front of their own home. Um, and so traffic calming was a way to address that. And we saw some changes occurred, actually, in Orange County. I think, it do, you know, really in response to this change. And we were seeing the most dangerous street in Orange County, and that was converted into a nice, safe street. And also had benefits, too, in reducing violence in the neighborhood, too. So traffic calming had a lot of side benefits. But I see traffic calming today is pretty well accepted. Um, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that the phrase traffic calming sounded odd to the ear. And I think Vision Zero now sounds odd to the ear. Like, what do you mean Vision Zero? So hopefully I'll get um, everyone here excited about um, Vision Zero. Oops. I like to think of the United States as being on the top of the list of any sort of international comparison. But here we are. Here's the United States on the top of the list. And the list is upside down. We, this is death rate per population. Um, the U.S. has really dangerous, um, and that's not widely understood. Our streets are as dangerous as Greece, Korea, Poland, Slovenia, you know, not Germany, France, not Scandinavia. Um, our streets are really dangerous. We're also, we don't hear this. Um, how many people had this idea that, maybe another show of hands here, a little exercise. Uh, how much, how many people understood that the streets in the U.S. are some of the most dangerous in the industrialized world. Good. I'm happy. To, uh, I'm not happy to hear that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but okay, good. It's, you know, this is important. That there's there's a problem out there. I don't think the general public understands that. Um, certainly, we're not going to hear from the regulatory agencies. They're not going to be championing the fact that you know the U.S. has dangerous streets. We're not going to hear this from the industry, the car industry, the insurance industry. They're not going to be the ones telling us that we have a problem in the United States. Um, so it's going to take an effort from, you know, from the professionals, the advocates, all need to start to get the word out here. Um, 
part of the issue we don't hear about this is that um, um, in the United States we often measure road deaths per distance driven, uh, which is a measure that traditionally has favored the U.S. because we drive more than other countries. But over the years, the U.S. has slipped back down this list. And here we're in a very mediocre position in terms of even a, such a favorable measurement as deaths per mile driven. If we look at a time trend since 1970s um, um, to the day, actually, we've done a good job, right? We've cut the deaths by 57%. That's great, right? Um, but if you look at the other industrialized, other typical other industrialized countries, we're seeing they've done a much better job. We're talking, you know, 81% reduction in the Netherlands. It's been like an 84% reduction in traffic deaths since the 1970s. As a little side note, um, in the 1972 Olympics, we're in Munich, and Sports Illustrated at that time um, ran an article about visiting Munich to watch the Olympics, and they talked about driving in Germany. And they talked about sort of these unspoken rules about driving in, in Germany on the Autobahn, you know, where there's no speed limits. And if you're driving a Fiat, you get out of the way of the Mercedes. And that sort of, there's a pecking order in which car, you know, yields to which car. And if you're in a Fiat, you know, you can't pass, you know, can't be in that fast lane. Um, and the, the final word of that Sports Illustrated article was the one word, and it was the word don't. But can you imagine a German now looking at America? And saying, talking about driving in America, and you know what would what they'd say? They would see that you know U.S. is way more dangerous than Germany. So, what happened? A couple things happened. Um, there, there are arguments out there that basically the reason for this decline in fatalities is really due to better trauma care. Um, there's an article out there that shows kind of the the success rate of murders, the ratio of. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> Good. You guys are paying attention. Um, um, you look at the ratio of murders to violent assaults, okay? Um, and if you look at that ratio over time and you compare that to deaths per mile driven, um, they follow a very similar track. The argument there that they're making is um, that it's better medical care, better trauma treatment. You know, we have a great system to whisk people away. We have regional trauma centers that specialize in trauma care. There's this golden hour. If you can get people treated within an hour, the survivability goes up. Um, there's also other things we, you know, so that's maybe one thing that's heard just right off the bat is just better trauma care. The other thing is, look what happened in the United States. We more or less started in the same position in the 1970s. They're all around 25, 30 um, deaths per 100,000. Um, and then we see they more or less have all declined at about the same rate until about like 1990. And in 1990, the U.S. sort of plateaued, you know. And what happened? And I don't, I don't have an answer. Um, I'd love to hear other answers. You know, in the early 90s, that's when um, airbags came into the to the fleet. Um, you'd think that would have um, made a difference. Um, we also had the SUV pickup craze sort of kicked in about that same time, and sort of contrary to marketing, contrary to sort of the public opinion, um, SUVs and pickup trucks have a very high death rate. They're not a safe vehicle to drive. Um, so maybe that occurred, you know, but not clear what went wrong in, at least I don't know. Okay, likely. Um, and then actually, one of the things that did occur, you know, the point you make there on the gas tax, um, and I don't know if you pushed down your little button, um, <laughs> um, you know, we, we do see in the last two years, it's been a huge drop in, in fatalities um, in the U.S. Um, actually, I, we did this talk um, two years ago, that number, not 57%, it would have been 49%. So there's been a big shift, especially in the U.S. We don't see that same shift in the last couple of years in the other country. But in the U.S., we've seen a big change in the last couple of years, and it's likely due to more expensive gasoline. Uh, that discourages, discourages miles driven, and probably also discourages the use of SUVs and pickups. Um, One thing that we do see that's happening in Europe that's not taking hold here is this whole idea of Vision Zero, and this is what the whole talk's about. Um, this started in Sweden in the early 90s. They were wondering how many people should die in car crashes, just sort of like s stepping back and think about it. And they looked around and they said, well, when it comes to other forms of transportation, like an airplane, you know, when a plane crashes, you know, 
One is we call it a crash, not an accident. A plane accident sounds really odd to my ear. Um, but when a plane crash occurs, we find the black box. We, was there icing on the wings? Was, the, was it pilot fatigue? There was that one episode in Buffalo where the pilot um, had come in that night on an overnight red eye from Seattle. She was being paid $20,000 a year or something like that, living with her parents and flying an airplane. So, you know, a really hard commute to get to her job to fly an airplane. Like, no, we don't like that. Um, train wrecks again, you know, what went wrong, you know, with the Metrolink down in Los Angeles, you know, the guy was texting apparently, um, the, the engineer, um, you know, no, we don't like that. Um, occupational, we, you know, we, we look at that now, you know, we have the miners rescued in Chile, um, you know, we put a lot of effort into basically saving those, those men, those miners. Um, um, likewise, in West Virginia, where we had the coal mine disaster, what, three, four months ago, again, you know, that mine had been um, under regulatory authority. It had been hit lots of violations of work rules. And so the question now is, well, how come the regulators hadn't shut that mine down? How come the regulators weren't there making a safe work environment? So, so in our work world and other forms of transportation, we just don't accept deaths. You know, it's just not acceptable. But when it comes to driving, you know, well, there's an article, you know, every, you know, there's, an, there's another accident and someone died sort of, acceptance of um, death when it comes to, um, to driving. It's, you know, in the U.S., it's like 2% of all deaths are due to car crashes. Um, that's one in 55 of us um, will die in a car crash. Um, that's a pretty big risk in my book. So we go back to the U.S. approach. In this audience, you guys all recognize the Green, green Book, the Bible of, of Traffic Engineering. Um, so this traditional safety approach, you know, is, you know, how to, you know, give a lot of fail-safe conditions, have a forgiving design. We want to um, make it so people don't run into things. But that's led to situations like this. This is a traditionally designed street, very forgiving design. There's nothing to hit. It's a very wide street. Look, there's only four cars. Um, you know, in the middle of the day, and this is big five-lane road. Um, the, everything's pulled back away from it. There's no trees close to the road, um, no median, nothing to hit, right? There's a road in Sacramento, which is my hometown, and this is in the south side of Sacramento. Um, this is a two-mile long section of road, um, and in the last decade, there have been 10 deaths on this road. This is a really dangerous road, um, but yet, yet it follows that traditional um, design. What happens when you have a street that's wide and smooth like this? You know, people speed up, and when the speeds go up, the injuries go up, and the severity of injuries go up. Another shift that occurs with Vision Zero is like, how do we, from the traditional approach to Vision Zero, is how do we measure safety? There's an awful lot of thinking that's spent on, well, where do the crashes occur? You know, what intersections have crashes? Um, let's do something about, that must be a dangerous intersection. A lot of crashes occur there. Or you hear measurements in terms of money costs. All, the, all these traffic accidents cost us billions of dollars. That's a lot of the discussion that occurs here is, is th those two measures. The Vision Zero approach measures it differently, um, and it's a, a health impact. W what crashes are causing a health impact? And when we say health impact, we're not talking about broken bones or you know cuts, bruises, things like that. We're looking at deaths, and we want to look at disabling injuries. These are things like spinal cord injuries cause paralysis, a serious brain injury that causes a cognitive impairment for the rest of your life. You have your bone, bones are so badly broken you can no longer walk; they can't be healed. These are what. So there's a threshold of what we consider, you know, a day. You know, this is a. This is a crash we con we're concerned about because it took someone's life, it was take a portion of someone's life away from them. Um, that's a new way of thinking that reshifts how we look at things. Vision Zero also has a strong ethical component. It's just not acceptable that people be killed or seriously injured, seriously chronic, chronic health impairment. Um, we we want to get do away with those. And how do we do that? Life is the important thing. And this is key. This is a big thing here. 
we can't trade a life for some other benefit. And that's going to be a, this, is, this shakes the transportation world. A lot of the transportation values are measured in terms of mobility, how quickly can you get from point A to point B, how much delay occurs at an intersection, level of service, all this sort of stuff. That's a very different way of measuring the performance of the system. If we look at how many people are dying in the system, we come up with a very different system. It is this shift. We're no, going, no longer going to be looking at crashes. I'm going to reiterate this. We want to eliminate these fatal and disabling crashes. Another piece is that we must do something. And that's a shift. You know, a lot of the things is what can be done for better pedestrian safety? What must we do for pedestrian safety? How do we make it easy for, for my child, my mother, for me to walk across the street? What must we do to make it so I can walk? What must we do that I can drive? I'm going to go drive to visit some friends tonight. How do I make sure that I arrive safely? What must we do? Traditionally, we look at the responsibility for the road safety. Um, we just look at the user. When the crash occurs, what happened? Oh, the person was intoxicated. Oh, the person was speeding. Oh, they ran a red light. Or the, the, uh, the blaming that, that bothers me the most is, oh, the child darted out in front of the motorist. That's totally wrong in my book. How can you say the child is the one going too fast in that situation? Totally wrong. Um, but that's kind of the traditional approach on safety is what, you know, the user, how does the user interact with the system? What did the user do wrong with the system? In the Vision Zero approach, we're going to see a different responsibility, and it's going to go on to the road designers. The road designers are responsible for the design of the road, obviously, the operation of the road, and the use of the road. Road designers need to step up to the plate and design safe roads. Mind you, the Vision Zero folks say, we expect the users to follow the rules that have been set up by the road designers. There's going to be situations, though, where we're going to have road users out there who are not going to follow the rules of the road. And there's many reasons we have failure to follow these rules. One is knowledge. You know, children, how can we expect a child to know the rules of the road? And there's physiological problem, issues with children that a child has less field of vision than we have and than, than an adult has. Um, their brains aren't hooked up enough that they can tell where a sound comes from. You and I know where sounds occur. We can identify, oh, that man's cough. OK, over there somewhere. Um, you know, we're, we're really good, but children can't do that. They don't understand perspective. Um, they think a large truck far away is more dangerous than a small car close to them. They're not small adults. They are children. They do not have the same cognitive abilities, the same physiological abilities that adults have. And yet we design the road system thinking that children can, can adapt. We teach children safety. Are they really road safety? Are children really able to grasp traffic safety education? Are they able to actually even cope with traffic? We also have road users out there who just aren't going to accept the rules. Um, you know, I've seen, I'm sure we've all seen them. Um, and we also have people with just lack of ability. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone in this room has seen an elderly or disabled person struggle to get across the road fast enough um, before the light changes. So when we have a system, we're going to have users out there that aren't going to know the rules of the road, not going to. Um, accept them, don't have the ability to, to deal with the rules of the road, designers must make the necessary modifications. We must design the roads so people with, who won't follow the rules, aren't able to follow the rules, can still use the system. How do we do that? And I, I, I like this slide. I have a great graphic artist who found this picture. Um, but the point here is the movie, um, The Right Stuff. And it was about um, the Mercury astronauts and they were, uh, um, there's a scene in there where they're put on this giant centrifuge and they're spun in circles and, and the astronauts think they're just being you know, tortured or played with or something. Um, but there was a real reason for doing that is how much, in the reentry of the capsule from outer space, just how much force can a human body withstand? And they concluded, you know, by spinning them around in the centrifuge, that you could withstand the force of 6G, six times the force of gravity. Um, and that's how they designed the reentry for these for the for the capsule coming back to the uh, to the Earth. 
In the Soviet um, space program, they had a flaw during reentry, um, and the cosmonauts in, were exposed to 22 times the force of gravity. They survived, thankfully, um, but they described their situation as excruciatingly painful. But the point I want to get across is there is a threshold, again, where a human body can withstand forces. So can we design a road system so the human body is not exposed to forces above that threshold? Yes. In a modern car, the users are seat belts. Um, you, can, you can withstand a head-on collision at 45 miles per hour. 45 miles per hour in both directions, head-on collision, and you'll survive that crash. So what do we do when the speeds are higher than 45 miles per hour? We use a median to separate the oncoming streams of traffic. Um, and we see that somewhat in America. Well, I think there's a lot more that we could do here. In Sweden, they've taken a lot of their two-lane rural roads, and they've strung a steel cable on posts between the lanes, added passing lanes every now and then. Um, but that's reduced these sort of head-on collisions. In a side impact, you know, there's a whole lot less sheet metal between you and the uh, intruding car in a side impact. You know, there's that much sheet metal. Um, you're pretty vulnerable in a side impact collision. Um, so the speeds need to be below 30 miles per hour. Um, so how do we do that? Traffic signals don't work. This sort of separating streams of traffic in time doesn't work. So we need to do away with traffic signals and use either four-way stop signs or roundabouts. That's, again, this gets back to performance measures. You know, four-way stop signs have a lot of crashes, but the crashes occur and they're not typically fatal, whereas traffic signals have fewer crashes, but they're typically more likely to be serious fatal injuries. So the old performance measurements of looking at crashes leads us to the decision to use traffic signals. But if you use this criteria, it says, no, let's use four-way stops or roundabouts. <coughs> roundabouts. You know, obviously the speeds go down because you have to turn to, to go into the, uh, um, into the roundabout itself. And then if a collision does occur in a roundabout between two different vehicles, you know, it's at an oblique angle. And so the, you know, there may be lots of body damage, but not much body damage. So, so we like to see, we, we rethink how we do intersections. You know, with, a, with a, just a person on the street, the amount of impact of trauma a body can withstand um, is 20 miles per hour, walking or bicycling. Um, so we need to do where we have children present, where we have bicyclists, pedestrian present, we need to get the speeds down below 20 miles per hour. A residential street like this is all wrong. Um, this needs to be traffic calm, the speeds down. Also things like um, school zones, you know, here in Oregon it's 20 miles per hour. Um, in California it's 25 miles per hour, that's too fast for a school zone. New Mexico, the school zone's 15 miles per hour, but we need to get, you know, make it easy for children to walk. I'm thinking that we can sell the Vision Zero approach to the public, and that's a good piece of the pie here in how we're going to make Vision Zero happen. We just need to get the public support. A piece of that is just the appeal of Vision Zero. I show this street as being sort of the traditional design. Um, I wouldn't want to live off the street. I think this street is ugly. Um, and whereas if you design a street with you know, raised medians, you know, with bike lanes, um, you can make a much more appealing street. You, you can imagine that property values off this street is much higher than the previous scene. Um, and just think of how nice it'd feel to come home on this sort of street, like, ah, I'm home, in, in contrast to um, the sort of traditional design, big slab of asphalt street. Anyway, I'm happy to take questions and remember to use the microphone. Is that uh, or you don't have a microphone? Raise your hand and John, will you do our microphone? Oh. For me? Thanks. Thanks for the talk, Peter. Um, a lot of us, uh, there's a lot of money and energy and time and people in the world of bicycling right now, and that means a lot of people are constrained either editorially or by their nonprofit mission statement to focus on bicycling. Do you or maybe somebody else in the room have kind of ideas for how Vision Zero could be a bicycling movement rather than, uh, it seems like the focus in your talk is as a pedestrian movement our uh, movement for focusing on cars and yeah do you have any policy recommendations for the bicycle world 
I think it'd be great to have this room discuss that. Um, I could see that quite easily that um, for, from a bicycle's perspective, you know, how do the fatal bicycle collisions occur? One, the bito fatal bicycle collisions are overwhelmingly, you know, a motor vehicle collision. Um, so basically, you need to stop motor vehicles from hitting bicyclists if you're, you're going to turn and reducing bicyclist deaths. And then what is the most common way for a bicyclist to get killed is to be hit from behind. So that's a strong argument for better facilities for bicyclists. But I'm sure there's room, some thoughts in this room. And I'd love to see the conversation get started. So. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, please. <laughs> Sadly, I think. Oh, yeah, next, you do two, and let's do that one. Um, on your first slide, I was wondering about the correlation between the fatalities and like the seatbelt law enforcement. Because, I mean, the seatbelts, people were using them, but they, it wasn't really enforced by law. And so the trend of uh, lowered fatalities, have you looked at a correlation with that at all? I, I don't know the answer. Um, I think that's a small piece of the overall pie. Um, there's people that argue whether or not uh, seatbelt laws have been effective. People argue whether or not airbags at the population level. So there's some controversy. And like I say, the, you know, the evidence seems to show that there's other people that argue in that you know murder success rate, which is in, in the magazine, in the professional journal called Homicide Studies, which I just love that title. Um, but there's a you know journal you know focused on homicide studies. And you know they're saying, hey, it's better trauma care that's out there. That's the overwhelming thing. I don't know. It'd be nice to parse it out. I haven't seen this sort of great conversation looking at all these pieces. Um, but maybe other people in the room know these, the answer. Oh, there's another question over. It was actually uh, continuing the conversation. Oh. Uh, but I do have a question okay. um, regarding uh, traffic design and or road, road facilities design. Um, Vision Zero requires that road designers are responsible for the safety of the road. How are they going to be held accountable? Oftentimes, w outside of the industry, those people have no name. And if they're going to be held responsible, how are they going to be held accountable? Because without accountability, there really isn't a responsibility. Yeah, so you, does the responsibility fall on the profession? Does it fall on the individual designer? I mean, who designed that street over there? Um, good question. I think one, a shift that's going to have to occur is these engineering manuals need to be rewritten. They need to be rethought, rewritten. Um, that's going to take a big effort. Um, and that's going to take some leadership within the traffic engineering world is to rethink these manuals and go through and find these lines like I found on page 67. And uh, that whole philosophy goes through. I mean, we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot more evidence-based road design come out. You know, this whole argument about street trees. You know, people thought trees were bad. Um, and there's... I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was a hot, sunny place. And there's a traffic engineer that did not allow any street trees within 20 feet of the roadway. Somehow that was a magic number. But that led to barren, ugly streets um, when you just get baked by the sun. We're seeing that, the whole argument about street trees changing as evidence gets developed. Um, the lane widths, the, the, we always had these 12 foot wide lanes. And there's, now we're seeing more and more research that says, well, maybe 10 feet, maybe even narrower. Um, um, do you want to add on? Two, two meters in Europe is about standard for, for, and that's about six feet, and most of their cars are smaller than ours, that's true, but two meters, you can fit uh, a Humvee through, a, a military vehicle through a two meter lane, so if you, can't, if you can fit that vehicle through a two meter lane, I think we can fit most of our vehicles through that, and that, okay. it seemed very safe while I was there. Jeff? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, the uh, we're talking about level of service. You know, you showed the road by your house, five lanes. I'm I'm curious what that is like during rush hour, and if you did try to apply, apply these principles to that road, what it would do for uh, the level of service there? Because obviously, a big factor in trying to make these changes would be, uh, you know, what if you resulted in you know much greater traffic congestion. Obviously, you do lose a lot of public support for that. I, Jeff, I think you're hitting on a really key question with this whole Vision Zero stuff, and, and I'm glad you brought it up. It is this whole, how do we sell this idea to the public? There's you know, the, the classic line that everyone's a traffic engineer. You know, everyone who drives knows, um, um, 
you know, knows how to design the road better. Um, you know, there's this trade-off. You know, you're getting at a trade-off. Is it fair to trade time, you know, reducing congestion at peak hour versus taking someone's life? And that's, that's an ethical question. And how do we get the public to see that they're going to suffer more delay, um, you know, at an intersection in exchange for making the road a safer road? So I, I would really like to see a discussion of how we sell this to the public. There's this tolerance and acceptance of, you know, for the longest time, 40,000 deaths, and now it's down to um, 35,000 deaths or whatever. Like I say, it's like one in 50 of us is going to die in a car crash. Um, we, um, I don't know. You're on point, or you're on my... I have a related question. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. Um, I had a related question to, to health. Um, uh, the, the quantifiable health cost impacts, because I think, you know, now that we're, we're in a down economy, everyone's thinking about, you know, the fiscal impacts of, of any policy. It seems there's two sides to it. There's obviously the, the health benefits of people um, uh, using more transportation options, and there's also the, um, the reduced health costs of a major crash. Have you seen any, any quantifiables of, you know, crash reduction policies? Yeah, there's Is two components there. Um, <coughs> there's maybe many components in what you brought up. <laughs> so this is good. Um, let's see if we can all make sense of it all. Um, you know, just the cost of crashes, you know, is, is high. Um, but, you know, in terms of lives, I think that's what, I, rather than money, um, I'm saying we should think in terms of lives, but keep going. The other big health component out there is that the health cost of being inactive is huge. Um, uh, Actually, I gave a talk yesterday on health and transportation, so uh, I'm really glad you uh, asked the question. Um, that, that's another hour-long presentation, so if you have time. Um, but, you know, in terms of disease burden is how the medical world sees. Um, that's a combination of lives lost, years of lives lost, plus years of life lost with a dis lost living with a disability. So it's a disability-adjusted life year, or D-A-L-Y. So number one is heart attacks, number two is strokes, number three is car crashes. So from a medical world, car crashes are the third biggest um, health um, burden. But you go back to number one, number two, heart attacks and strokes, a third of the heart attacks, a third of the strokes are caused by inactivity. Plus a lot of the other sort of other lesser disease burdens are also caused by inactivity. So the whole way we've thought about our road system and how we get around, sort of this George Jetson approach from the 1950s where you'd, if you remember George, he would get into his flying car and leave his home and he'd end up at his office. He'd walk on some moving walkway to his desk and, you know, basically never move his body at all. You know, that was the, that was the goal of 50 years ago. Uh, he did. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that was a, uh, cartoon art. Um, and that's what we kind of move that way. You know, you, you walk from your house, you get into your car, you um, um, drive to your office, and you take the elevator up to your office. I mean, there's a lot of people that live that George Jetson life, you know, without the flying car. So, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of the cost we see in America of health care. You know, America has a very expensive healthcare system. Is it poor delivery, inefficient delivery? Are doctors overpaid? Are we using too high-tech equipment? Or are Americans really not healthy? Um, you know, uh, that's, I'm falling that last camp, by the way. Um, and what was the, the old factoid? It's um, a third or a quarter of all Medicare expenditure is due to obesity-related conditions, and obesity is basically due to inactivity. Um, and Medicare is 14% of the federal budget. That works out to be 3% of the federal budget is basically spent on inactivity. Um, so could we spend some of that health care money to build our communities in such a way to encourage more physical activity, get that? That's part of it. I think we also need to get the public aware that, you know, 
maybe I should think about living in a place where I can walk a quarter mile to the grocery store. Um, so I, you know, I get out every day. Maybe I should think about moving close to my office. So I, rather than do the George Jetson thing, I actually bike to my office. Um, you know, how do we get rid of? So one is how do we get the world, the community, the public at large to accept that physical activity is something we really need and want? Um, how do we get the money um, to make our communities sort of fix our communities? Do traffic calming? Um, make our intersections easier to walk across, make our cities easier. Portland's a great example. Done this great job of encouraging more bicycling. You know, these relatively small fixes on the, on the bridges led to this blossoming of people bicycling across the bridges. Uh, that was tied in, though, with Portland, um, putting a cap on the number of parking spaces downtown. How many cars? I mean, look at all these pieces that were put in place over all these years in Portland um, to make you know, a healthier community. How do we do more of that? I'm rambling, aren't I? And, and, and how do we get other cities to do that? Um, um, I'd look for answers, but uh, I, did I answer the question or just <laughs> went no, bab babbling? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, did, you, did you, did you want to? Um, what about new policy or legislation for, I know especially with senior citizens and elderly people or younger people, they've now changed the laws, making it old, you know, they have to be 18 to drive or something, but once you get your license, it seems that people don't ever have to recertify. Like, they take a test, but they don't have to retake a driving, like, test with somebody, maybe mm -hmm. making people actually take a road test with someone. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, My question was almost exactly what you were saying, and it had to do with... Yeah, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we have an audience, obviously. <laughs> Um, my question has to do with that as far as making, a, in a preventative sense, making a driver's license much more difficult to get in the first place and then having the retesting. So maybe there's a lot more physical testing, not just a written test where somebody could memorize an answer, regurgitate it, but have several tests before they're approved and maybe after the age of 60 or something there's retesting every two years. I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, what can we change with the users, which is slightly different than the Vision Zero approach. Um, uh, Ralph Bueller, um, Jennifer knows, who works with John Pooker, and maybe some people in the audience have read, you know, some of the, they've done a lot of publications together. He described um, growing up in Germany and getting his driver's license in Germany, and he's driving with the uh, inspector or whatever the word is, the evaluator, um, next to him, and he flunked the test. And what happened, there was a man waiting across the street, and didn't slow down, didn't anticipate that that person might have walked across the street. Um, poof, you know, and I think to an American, that's just a really strange concept that you would have lost your driver's license for that. Um, you know, the dangerous drivers are the teenagers. You know, the, the elderly have a high death rate per mile driven. That's part of it because they don't drive very much, so they're not a big threat to the rest of us. And they're fragile. You know, as we get older, we get more fragile. Um, so, you know, they're not the dangerous drivers. The, the dangerous people out there are the teenagers. And uh, OK, I didn't keep track of whose hand went up first, so I'll take you and uh, yeah, please. Um, do you, uh, actually, back on the health subject, what's the reasoning, or could you elaborate more on why changing the performance measure will necessarily help, uh, like, have safer streets instead of, you know, because you do all accidents. Instead of measuring health, like what's, the, you know, what's the methodology behind that? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a rethinking of what crashes we want to avoid. Um, so, you know, these low speed crashes where, um, you know, or moderate speed crashes where there's, you know, fender benders and stuff like that, we don't care about. Um, so we want to look only at where the fatalities occur, and, you, and you'll see a different mapping of the injuries. And I, I haven't seen it, but I'd love to see it. You know, where all crashes versus fatal crashes. If you get enough data, I think that'd be a that'd be a fun little paper to write. Um, uh, uh, does that answer your question, or? Yeah. And you? 
Um, yeah, just to kind of go back to, uh, I guess, like what these what these two women were saying about um, having a license that's more difficult to obtain. Mm -hmm. um, we can sort of educate drivers to use the road more safely, but if the road isn't um, promoting safe driving, then it's then that's more in like the individual responsibility, which can be broken. Um, and you were saying how. Um, uh, the users of the road fa uh, fail most often due to lack of knowledge, responsibility, and ability. Um, so what type of like specific urban design can we use to promote those uh, like ideas actually on the road? Um, there was like one example that I could think of that I'm very fond of in uh, Bogota, Colombia, where um, the mayor there realized that it was ridiculous that a pedestrian has to step down from a curb into the road space. Mm -hmm. And he thought that that should be opposite. The car should go into the pedestrian space and have that, um, have that suggestion. Mm -hmm. So in intersections, like in, uh, in the actual box, he raised the pedestrian walkways to the height of the curb mm -hmm. and thus like, installed like, these different types of speed bumps. Um, so what actual like urban design can we use to sort of enforce this, uh, this knowledge and, uh, and recognition of other users? Uh, the roundabouts, the intersections, intersections in America are very dangerous places, so that's an obvious candidate for fixing. Um, so I, I like the idea of the uh, sort of raised crosswalks, and just as the routinely way we design crosswalks. Mm -hmm. We're almost, I think the existing system here is almost like, you know, this is back to this evidence-based methodology that we talked about earlier with street trees and lane width. You know, there was this thinking that marking a crosswalk gave, a, you know, resulted in a more dangerous crosswalk. And this is basically saying, no, we make the crosswalk very visible. You know this is where the cross, the driver will know this is where the crosswalk exists. Um, what other changes, maybe that's bouncing around the audience, but we got to, um, I saw some other hands that have been up for a while, so. I have kind of two questions. First of all, I think the, the entry of an ethical component into this is really interesting and probably, um, probably scares a lot of engineers out there. Mm -hmm. um, and as an engineer, I can <laughs> say that. Um, the, other, the other components that you didn't touch on as much as an, and I'm interested in is so the components of you know, slowing people down, whether it be at intersections, roundabouts, using four-way stops, um, it's going to slow everybody down, presumably make them get wherever they're going. It's going to take a longer time. Um, and I was wondering if you've tried to advertise this strategy as kind of disincentivizing driving um, and how that could impact you know, the bicycle pedestrian that people might think takes me longer to get to work, I'm going to try other modes. And the second question is, how would you integrate you know, public transit into these strategies um, in a way that maybe by having you know, a public transportation option, the convenience of that option would go up because vehicular travel would go down? So two questions, and I have a small mind here, so we'll have to see. You know, you know what happens with public transit? You know, um, there would certainly be some way to make public transit more appealing. Certainly, traveling by public transit is is pretty low risk. Um, um, the downside I've always heard with um, public transit is actually walking to and from the bus stops are actually may be very very risky sort of activities. And I'm sorry, I have a s small memory, but the first one. <laughs> the first one was uh -oh. how these strategies could, you know, maybe um, inadvertently produce more folks that are willing to walk and bike because of the, the slowdown in the vehicular travel. I, I think you know, people's perception of the danger of walking and bicycling I think is a little bit out of line with the, the, the reality. Uh, people are afraid to walk and bicycle, afraid to let their children walk or bicycle. Um, and so reducing the danger of the road, I think it has huge benefits for encouraging walking and bicycling. Just, just reducing the, the fear factor. And you add in, well, if it's not, if it's less convenient to walk or to drive, because it now takes me, it used to take me 10 minutes, now it takes me 15 minutes, you know, maybe that will encourage some mode shift over to walking and bicycling um, and transit. Um, I think that's a, that's a real good point. And I guess there's a little bit of a follow-up. Um, can you just briefly say, you know, how this presentation was received at ODOT, which is a very, you know, pro-vehicle, pro-speed usually organization, and that's kind of what this isn't. Yeah, it's the ORTEC. Um, yeah, okay. And, you know, it generated lots of conversation, which is, which is delightful. Um, there was this whole conflict, and I hear it in this room also, what's, you know, this trade-off between, you know, 
convenience, speed, um, delay versus life. Is it fair to trade a life for someone's congestion? And I think that's, again, it's going to go back. We heard these other questions here. How is the public going to perceive that? Are people willing to accept taking that five-lane road and, and maybe redoing it into a three-lane road? Um, even that, that means maybe it's a safer road, but it might mean more delays, more, more time to get home. How do we, you know, as professionals, sell that idea that this is a trade-off we think is important? You know, it's, we need to get that public acceptance that um, traffic crashes are a big problem. And I, that's going to be a hard sell. I think people are pretty accepting of traffic crashes. They, they you know, and it's, and, you know, it's, you know, the industry is out there saying, oh, you know, buy a, buy a Suburban. You know, General Motors advertises Suburban. Give, the, your, give your family the security it deserves. You know, like, yikes, that's a really dangerous thing, you know, f you know for, your, for your children, for your family. Um, how do we counter that, uh, that advertising, that strong voice that's out there in the, from the industry? Uh, do we have time or... Um, I, I, I being the moderator, I'm going to jump in because okay. um, we have several people who have, who are watching on the web, which is why we make you use the microphones, um, who have sent in some questions. Some of them overlap. So there are a few who are wondering, have you seen any cities, states, or other jurisdictions in the U.S., Oregon, or elsewhere who are moving towards this Vision Zero? We're starting to see other... Um, um, we're seeing Sweden picked it up first. Um, Norway is now accepted and has now accepted the Vision Zero approach. In the United States, we're seeing Minnesota um, has towards zero deaths. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means in the real world. I understand Utah is starting to use this word. In California, the Office of Traffic Safety talks about towards zero deaths, but I don't see the movement yet. Um, I think we're still at sort of, like I say, where traffic calming was maybe 20 years ago. Are there others we need to catch? I'll let one or more in first. Uh, yeah, I've lost track of numbers, but go ahead, please. Um, I was just wondering, they're coming out with the Highway Safety Manual, and I don't know if you've had time to really review that or look through it, but do you think it'll be a useful tool, and, or did it not go far enough? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to what the Highway Safety Manual is going to look like, and maybe someone in the room knows. Um, you know, I, th I think there is a huge shift going on as we get more and more evidence-based traffic engineering. You know, the lane with the street trees, um, this whole traffic, you know, signalized intersection versus four-way stop signs. I mean, we're seeing this shift occur um, and how that's being picked up. I see revising these manuals is really, really important. And so I don't, I just don't know. Maybe someone in the audience, um, our greater audience, might know the answer to that, too. Sir? Um, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, also the public perception part of uh, this project. Um, and when you talked about the principles of Vision Zero, I'm almost thinking of even these new lifestyle centers or mall developments that really actually have some of the principles um, that we are advocating for. And I wonder if communicating to the populace that going to upscale stores is what we want to, are the principles that we want to apply to their uh, lives in the, in the general public is almost detracting from the utility of putting that in. And I'm curious as to your opinion on that. I don't, I, Frank, I don't understand the question, so. Um. It's, um, it would seem that some of the traffic calming and making the pedestrian the important part of the street life is something that lifestyle centers um, and new shopping centers are doing to encourage people to linger longer, stay longer, and spend more money. And I wonder if uh, some of the principles in Vision Zero of making the pedestrian and cyclist more important um, is almost kind of artificial to the public, and they may not see the actual utility and use of uh, these principles in their lives and on their streets. And I wonder if that's something that, a message that we can counteract somehow. Yeah, good question. I don't know. Is there someone in the room who want to take upon that one? Yeah. I have um, actually a question. Um, I was 
Please. Uh, Dan Burton and Ian Lockwood um, are two consultants um, who go around to different cities and engage neighborhoods, um, uh, community business leaders to really look at revisioning different areas. They were recently on uh, 122nd Division in Powell, um, which is just a, a place where the businesses, if you look at it, have just abdicated the street. You know, the, the parking is, is um, sidewalk side and, uh, and bringing people in like with a measuring tape and um, looking at uh, having the idea of like what if the speeds were lower on your street? What if there was more connectivity in this area that there, you know, you connected the cul-de-sacs um, so that so that you didn't have the burden on one arterial. Like what what if like then the businesses and they have examples, incredible examples of super blocks that have been redesigned to um, to be calmer where the traffic has actually been smoother and they've had more car throughput because there have been fewer crashes um, and businesses have been vitalized and this includes uh, low, low, traditionally low income communities. Um, anyway, it's really fascinating. I think it's walkable, walkable communities is um, their website. It has some great examples. Thanks. Question in the back? I just had a question on, it seems like most of these, uh, I guess I call them fixes for the roundabout and everything seem to be more sort of residential type things. I was wondering if Vision Zero was also planning on going towards major arterials, such as freeways and stuff like that, if they've started looking into anything like that. Uh, yes, I think it would be all streets, and maybe give it a little bias towards, um, but no, exactly. How do we get an intersection with a lot of traffic volume? Um, how do we get th people there through there quickly or, th or safely? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so it's, it's going to be all um, the entire street network. Please. Uh, yeah, I, my question relates to the previous question, and that is on on, on bigger highways. <coughs> uh, there's a project going on here in Portland region, a $4 billion uh, bridge uh, project. And one of the reasons for building this, this $4 billion new bridge across the Columbia River is that they have a lot of accidents uh, because of uh, mainly rear enders, uh, because of backup traffic. And, and, uh, and they say, well, they have to design this new bridge to meet federal uh, highway standards and and so my question is about highway standards if right now they have a, a lot of of low impact accidents but if you build a big eight lane or 12 lane freeway and you're going to have more traffic you're, the accidents are going to be at faster speeds and you're going to have more vmt more uh, people driving is that going to be the the way to go and and how do you counteract this argument that Basically, the devil makes us do it. We have to design this in a way that is unsafe. Yeah, I think that's a great wrap-up question. Um, I think it reiterates, you know, kind of the key point. You know, is we start looking at fatal crashes and not crashes. So here we're thinking about spending, you know, a mind-boggling amount of money. Um, you know, what's the opportunity cost for that four billion dollars? What else could we do with that four billion? So we're thinking about four billion dollars to resolve a bunch of fender benders, but yet maybe people are dying elsewhere in the system. Um, maybe that money should be spent elsewhere. Uh, but that's that whole tension that I think we're seeing in this conversation in the room. How do we get the public to think? You know, this is the stuff we want to support. You know, the, the stuff that actually makes our roads safe, and this is our definition of safe. Not, not crashes, but where people are dying. So maybe this, is, maybe this is an opportunity for Portland to get this conversation going. No, we're not concerned about these fender benders. Yeah, they're, they're bad, but that's not what we're concerned about. We're concerned about people dying on the system. And that leads to a, a very different way of how we'd spend that $4 billion. And if we throw in the health component you know, that was talked about earlier, then maybe we'd spend the money you know, in, in an even different way. You know? So what is our criteria for spending money? How should we, what, what is our priority? What should we be doing? Um, I think that's the whole, that's the uh, $4 billion question. <laughs> All right, Thanks. then, before we um, thank uh, Peter for coming and 
speaking with us today. I'll put a plug in for next week's seminar. Uh, we will have Brendan Haggerty, uh, who's with the Clark County Health Department. He'll be talking about a health impact assessment they've been working on for the pedestrian bicycle plan for uh, Clark County, so a related topic. And thank you um, again, Peter, for coming today. Thank you for having me. It's been really nice. Let me get rid of this.